James Carulian, uh, it's a, an Armenian note. When I started out in, in, uh, in my work, I used to collect the envelopes that I received because I used to get lots of um, interesting variations on my name. I, uh, I was particularly fond of letters to Mr. Draconian <laughs> um, and then Mr. DeLorean, potential uh, businessman. And I think my very favourite one, if you remember nothing else that I'm sure you'll remember, um, I had just one that was addressed to Mr. James Geraint. <laughs> um, so this morning it is an interactive session. If you violently disagree, if you want to ask anything at any point, then um, please log in your, your questions or your ideas. It's going to be interactive, so um, my mission is to make sure that, that you stay awake and engaged, and I will endeavour to do that. So I'm going to look this morning at radical approaches to rural development. And this is picking up on your conference themes, particularly around communities, also in relation to policy making and to innovation. So it's those three areas that I want to pick up on this morning. We'll take a look at some of the, the meanings in a moment. Um, just to give you an idea of, of where I'm coming from. Um, instead, it's quite fascinating being surrounded by these lovely uh, drawings of yours. And um, as, I, as I said to one of your colleagues, I'm sure that uh, there are any psychologists in the room. I'm sure that the psychologists would have a field day in, in terms of interpreting these. Um, so, me, I, uh, I come from a practice background. So for 30 years I've been engaged in rural community development and that's been in the UK and mainly within Europe as well. So my work has, has variously been with um, rural communities in helping them to keep their services, to um, undertake projects, to stitch together funding for projects. And then about 18 years ago I went to the University of Newcastle in the northeast of England, where I was a project officer, and I took on part-time lecturing. And really my crossover from practice into academia was to do with the fact that as a project officer, I felt I could only reach a relatively small number of people, whereas hopefully, by enthusing and encouraging many, you can get a lot more people engaged in working for the countryside, whether that's in Ireland, in the UK, wherever. <clears throat> I come very much from a, a community development background. So community development, what, what is that? Any, any takers? If you were explaining to a Martian what community development is all about, how would you describe it? Don't just speak at once. <laughs> I would say better for the school. Say again? You need a plan better, better for the school, for instance. Okay, so it, 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 it certainly relates to things like um, service delivery, like schools, and so on. Community development is really built around two P's, two P words. The way that we do things, and what comes out of the sausage machine. So the way that we do things, what's a P word to describe the way that we do things? Yes, it is practice. But, yeah. So the process, um, it is about practice, but that process, the way in which things are done in community development terms, is as important as what comes out at the end. So a second P word, what is that? other P word, the thing that emerges. So the, the practice, the process, the product, the thing that, that we get at, at the other end. And community development principles are jargon-ridden. 
Um, and I'm not going to belabor the point on a Friday morning. I don't think you'd thank me for, for going into hyperdrive with um, you know, social capital and, and approaches to facilitation and so on. I've just listed a, a few of them here. Um, let's say that I um, empower Amaya to become a wonderful curling player. Well, she already is. Well, there you go. <laughs> so that would be in, in the realms of empowerment, this idea of, of giving skills, capability, ability to, to do things. Facilitation, if we facilitate things, we're smoothing the way, we're making it easier. And then capacity building, this idea in community development of communities being raised in terms of their capabilities, what they can achieve. And then finally, um, you can see my, my qualifications, I won't, uh, I won't go on about those. What I'm going to be um, talking about, has everybody got a copy of the, the notes? So you don't need to worry too much about the, um, the detail, but I'm going to obviously be embellishing uh, what it says on, on these PowerPoints and, and developing them. The session this morning is, is built on consultancy research undertaken for the Carnegie Trust, so a very large charitable organisation. In this particular case, the, the aim of our work has been to determine the skills and knowledge that rural communities will need to become more resilient and adaptive to change over the next 20 or so years. So if we wanted to, to give a shortcut to that, what, what are we actually looking at here? Um, a very key concept in particularly uh, social science approaches to the planet and to development. I'll give you a clue. It's an S word. Everybody uses it. Scatter it to the four winds. The pursuit of... Yeah. So we're looking at sustainability here. And the two words, resilient and adaptive, have, have become... Um, they've entered the currency quite recently. This idea of communities being able to resist shocks and to adapt to things like peak oil and to, uh, to take on approaches to climate change remediation, <coughs> responding to the particular um, concerns that are imminent what I want you to do just, um, just for, let's say, one minute, is to think from your own experience, whether it is from Ireland or wherever, just want you to turn to the person next to you, or find the person next to you, and think about maybe two of those skills and knowledge that you think rural communities will require in order to become much more resilient um, over the next 20 years. So, just one minute, I want you to generate, let's say, one skill and one bit of knowledge that you think is going to be critical. Can we clear what you do? Okay then, let's, um, let's just compare notes as to that's the way you've got to. I reckon you're beginning to drift into um, your social life at the weekend now, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll just come back and, and compare notes on one of those skills that you feel that rural communities will need to develop and one of those areas of knowledge. So, anybody want to volunteer? A skill, first of all. Great. 
Okay, so so the idea of independence. Do you set the beginning by all means for to try and gain independence from it and lose the dependency on it just where you are? Yep. Great. Independence, self-reliance. What we'll do is we'll we'll come back and look at how your ideas match up with those that we generated from the research itself. Somebody else? Yeah. Communication. Communication. Do you want to just say a bit more about that? Communication skill is in terms of getting the message of what it is you want to do across. Yes. You've read the report. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Another one. Uh, planning, balance, development, planning. Yep. How the future know what services and speeds it to be needed. Okay, so, so some sort of um, sensible planning, perhaps a vision of yeah. the future. Yeah. Great. <coughs> Anybody else want to lob in a skill that you think is going to be crucial? About knowledge, then. Let's, let's turn to knowledge. How about knowledge? This is fascinating. This is when you, when you look in a particular direction. People, people uh, develop a fascination with their shoes. I'm not going to catch his eye because it could be dangerous. Um, knowledge. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the, the skill that is knowledge, it's, it's a capacity to access knowledge around the world, so the IT skill to, yep. uh, to access knowledge and to adapt it to the local situation. Yeah. You know, what's right. the best practice happening around the world? So IT access. Is. Great. And I mean, one of the, one of the, the key issues that um, is often lost in rural community development is the, the asset basis, A, B, C, D asset-based community development, the fact that there is such a wealth of human capability within even the smallest communities. When I worked in the northeast of England, I was chatting to a little guy, um, looked perfectly innocuous. He turned to me and he said, James, um, that heritage project in, in our village, which is only 200 people, um, would it help if I put £40,000 sterling into, into this project? This man was a millionaire. So you have access not only to the external sources, but also within the community, such a, a richness of, of assets which are available. Any other knowledge that you think is critical? Yes, yes. Um, linked to the the planning is the the idea of community led planning, various needs assessments which communities would make of themselves, whether these are community appraisals, audits whether they are um, much more active techniques like planning for real, for example, where you're using model, um, models created by the community in order to establish uh, what their aspirations are. Any other, one final bit of knowledge? Any, anybody else on the knowledge front? Yes, I think that's a, that, that's a very good point. The ability to organise. Um, and in terms of community development, there's often this idea of quick wins. The idea that you can achieve small things rapidly to encourage the community to do more. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep... Community involvement. I think one of the biggest issues in community is getting involved uh, rather than hanging the decision making and the actions and so on around the key people from rolling it out to as many people as possible involved. Yes. And contributing to the community. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, there is that danger, particularly within smaller communities, that um, it is a few willing people who are always doing the, the activities. And that makes it very fragile. If somebody keels over, if they leave the community, then that can be the death of, of a community-based project. So what did we actually do in, in this piece of work? Um, what we were trying to do was to look beyond the usual suspects in terms of community development. So we were trying to look beyond the obvious players, whether they are county council, whether they are uh, looking at local voluntary organisations within a community. And in particular, we wanted to, to understand, as Michael's just mentioned, the, the motives as well as the skills of radical community developers. In order to do this, um, we wanted to try and see how the, the more formal community-led planning linked up with those radicals, with those people that often fall off the radar. The sorts of people that we were interested in would be involved in things like transition town initiatives. Any takers on transition towns? Does that term mean anything to you? Transition towns, um, an international approach to climate change remediation, is where communities are trying to develop ways of acting to preempt peak oil and to reduce their energy usage and to do things like making more use of local produce. Furthermore, we were trying to look at um, how these sort of formal and radical links can be fostered and to also try and see how both formal community-led planning and the role of activists can be brought together in order to produce something of mutual benefit. And don't forget that what I'm talking about here, I hope will be of relevance across the board, or many of the, the issues you may be able to relate to, but the work we did was looking at rural England, and there has been separate work undertaken within Ireland. So, what was clear, um, at least initially, from, from a number of the discussions was the fact that, and looking at the, the literature, was the fact that people are unsurprisingly apprehensive. There is a climate of worry and concern in relation to change and how communities can survive. In particular, within rural England, there are concerns about ageing communities and the fact that um, the population balance is, is moving out of kilter. So you're getting many more older, wealthier people um, and younger individuals in particular being priced out of the market. Secondly, the research was looking at um, some examples of single issue activism. So, so looking at responses to climate change, looking at things like community land trusts. What are those? What does it sound like? Buying land in trust community. Five points. Great. Yeah. So community based ownership of land or buildings in order to generate affordable housing for local people. Of course we needed to, to have some sort of definition, some sort of peg on which to hang our understanding of 
radicalism and radical activists. And what we came up with was those who actively seek to create innovative solutions to enhance and sustain their community. So it was partly to do with improvement, it was also to do with continuation. And I guess there's some, there are another, a number of other words we could quibble about, we could argue over. So let's pick on innovative. What does, what does that mean? What does innovative mean? If you're highly innovative, as I'm sure you will. Yeah, absolutely. So we're back to, to this central idea that we mentioned in development in terms of process, how things are done, as well as what's produced. I guess the, the other key thing about innovation as opposed to invention, um, quoting my colleague Professor Malcolm Mosley, is that an innovation is an idea, practice, or object that is perceived as new. So it's a perception of newness. In many senses, there's nothing new under the sun, but a perception in one place of newness um, can be understood in terms of innovation, <coughs> innovative. So those are the, the areas that, that we were seeking to, to look at. Um, in terms of, of community-led planning, this idea of, of the community leading the way, we can really see three benefits of a community-led approach. I'll tell you the first one, and then you've got to work out the other two. So the first key benefit of community-led planning is an ability to influence outside agencies. So influencing a housing provider, a local authority, a service provider, by showing the aspirations of, of the community. Okay, what do you reckon the second one might be? If we're influencing outside the community, then the second one could be? Great. It ain't rocket science. So, influencing within the community, just as important, looking within to see what is possible. Back to the idea that we had earlier on of, who was it that came up with the independence, the self-reliance? Ah, thank you. I thought you were all going to keep quiet then. <laughs> Make him sweat. Who did it? Um, yes, so this idea of influencing, you know, you might have a, um, a, day, a daycare centre for elderly people within a community that innovates by saying, hey, let, let's bring in young parents, maybe single parents, have cross generational links and benefits for both. So, influencing externally, influencing within, and then the third one is the most nebulous benefit of community members coming together and doing something. We're back to the process. What do you think that third benefit might be? External, internal, a result of, let's say, you lot. You don't know each other, you get together, you decide you want to, to do something. What do you gain in the process of meeting and talking? Becoming a group. Becoming a group. 
Yeah. So becoming a group, um, understanding each other, understanding each other's capabilities. So there is that intangible um, capacity building, growing in confidence in skills and so on. So let's move on. How did we try and determine who the radical activists were, um, what were their concerns for the future, what were the skills that they felt would be valuable. By sifting through um, literature and also by discussing with <coughs> practitioners, in particular gatekeepers, people who were working with communities in various ways as community development workers, um, housing providers, credit union operatives and so on, we really came down to a focus on those working on housing provision, the key issue in the English countryside, um, working in relation to community transport, so car sharing, the use of post buses, um, sharing mini buses and so on, renewable energy, climate change remediation, all sorts of interesting projects, uh, like in the Lake District, using sheep's wool in order to um, lag and insulate the local community hall, using solar lighting for uh, street lighting within a particular village. And also, we were looking at innovative service delivery, things like multi-use. So you might have a, um, a local council office that doubles up as the post office where the policeman works from, um, and you also have some sort of um, crash. We conducted focus groups with 30 of these community development workers. So community development workers. Um, for this next bit, I need two willing volunteers. If I don't get them, then I'll just have to put the arm on somebody. Um, no pressure. Do I have a, do I have a willing volunteer for this side of the house? Do you remember that? No. On this side of the house? Okay, well, I'm just going to. <laughs> Community development workers were from right across England, and uh, as we've seen, community development workers, they can be understood as intermediaries. Another way is um, community glue, or 
patchworkers. Anybody do patchworking? Do you do patchwork? It's very sexy. Do you do patchwork? Yeah. Anybody do patchwork? You were nodding to me over here somewhere. Didn't you nod at me? <laughs> so, what is a patchwork? Yes, piecing things together, exactly. It's, it's stitching together. So these community development workers are stitching pieces together in order that projects um, come into being. And then finally, within this uh, group of research subjects, we had what we call parish clerks. Um, they don't exist in Ireland. Um, these are uh, public sector organisations that represent small villages or towns. They range from maybe <coughs> three women and a dog to um, in excess of 70,000 people. So a huge range of, uh, of coverage. What did we discover from, from these discussions with the various players? The first thing that, that we discovered is that there's a mobile dentist just outside. Um, but that apart, the key things that, that we learnt about um, skills and knowledge in relation to, to rural communities. First of all, is that there were very entrenched attitudes and there was an innate conservatism with a little c. Um, so in a sense, as a, a generalisation, the innovation, the new ideas were somewhat anathema to, to many people involved in rural community development. Do you think that is a truism within rural Ireland? Or not? Depends what the project is. It depends what the project is. Okay. If it was uh, an extension of the rural transport scheme to the very rural areas, there wouldn't be any objection at all. Yeah. So it depends what the community needed yeah. and how collective their view was of that need. And I think in all communities, we also have a big issue of this problem that they want among the groups. And in terms of knowledge, I suppose one of the big areas of knowledge is how a team works, how a team gets together, what the different players are, yeah. their own agenda, even within the community. Yeah. Yeah? I think it would be very important. Okay, and going back to um, Michael's point earlier on about motivation, why people are are getting involved within their rural communities. A key consideration has been, and I, I'm going to use the word advisedly, it's, it's an interesting word because, um, because it conjures the wrong instant response in the brain. But the, the key sort of motivation has been self-interest. Now as soon as you say self-interest, people think selfishness. People think, you know, I'm alright Jack whatever benefits you need. But self-interest is, is really a recognition of the way that people have become involved. For example, a local shopkeeper may be involved in a regeneration project <coughs> because they see a benefit to business. So there are different constructions around self-interest. So the first issue is one of entrenchment. Secondly, we're back to the, this idea of access, particularly in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, but also the idea of infrastructure in terms of the way that groups are um, organised or not. So inadequate ability to organise, but also inadequate, um, and I've got up here the example of bus provision. Thirdly, there's a clash between representative 
and participative democracy. So what does that mean on a Friday morning? What does that mean? A clash between representative and participative democracy. You may confirm. <laughs> Do you want to? Well, I think that it might be a question of, of people who actually are motivated, want to participate. So some, some of them are kind of ordered because they represent the organized structure of the decision makers. <laughs> and they are ordered to, to participate. And yes. the other people are those who want to participate. And, and there's a lack of those who want to. Yes, so the, the representative democracy part. This is where we're talking about councillors. This is where we're talking about people who are within formal structures of power, who are voted probably by a relatively few number of people um, into positions of authority. So the, the representative, and then you've got the participative. Those who are choosing to participate, who are volunteering, who don't have um, a formal place within the hierarchy. So there is, what, what we discovered in terms of barriers was the fact that these very local parish councils were variable at best. Um, you know, when they were good, they were very, very good. When they were bad, they were terrible. And the terrible ones were where the community stepped up and said, well, forget you lot, you're not representative, we're going to fill the void. And then we're back again to, to something Michael was mentioning, the, the fragility of a lot of rural community development. The same people being willing to do things. And the dangers of burnout, leaving, dying, falling under a bus, whatever. So if those were <coughs> barriers to adaptation coming through from the research, what about what about the the ingredients that <laughs> that those within focus groups, those within um, who were radical operatives, came up with for uh, ingredients for community action. First of all was the, the perception of the need for gritty steel and determination. Stickability, an ability to remain engaged to, to have stamina. Secondly, the importance of leaders or leadership. So often it is one or two inspirational figures, but as we've already heard, that, that carries dangers. More broadly, was seen as the importance <coughs> of leadership amongst the many. Thirdly, and we're picking up on your communication idea. Who's, who came up with communication? Great. So that was definitely one of the, the key messages, the ability to sell. Again, you know, selling conjures perhaps a, an unfortunate image. But it's the idea of communicating key messages from different sections of the community and being able to sell those benefits within and without. Communication too, in terms of chairing meetings, um, you know, being able to organise and to be inclusive, to draw in. Crucially, listening skills, um, diplomacy, an ability to manage conflict. And again, uh, we came to from the top down. Okay, we'll have a little bit of a, a couple of minute energizer here. 
um, which is just a fancy word for saying that I'm going to get you out of your chairs and, um, and get you involved in something. It's all caught on camera, uh, even for the start, so this is, we're all in this together. What I wanted to do is, um, who in the room, if you stick your hand up, who in the room is not from Ireland? Okay, that's okay, this is going to be a slight challenge, but that, that's why. What I want you to do is, um, this is going to require you to talk to each other. Um, I am going to represent Galway. Okay? Here we are. I'm Galway. Now what you're going to do is, you've got to talk to each other and we're going to create a human map of Ireland. Okay? So all of you will be represented by where you happen to live. Right? And, you know, I don't want to get into, well, is it my primary residence or is it my second residence or whatever. So, um, here am I. I'm in Galway. I want people to come up, out of their chairs, the uh, Irish place people themselves. Yeah. Irish, Irish people. I'm coming to that. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with that. Galway. So, we need to arrange ourselves around Galway in terms of where you're You mean people who live here, not just people who were born here. <laughs> you see, this is what I mean. It's a nightmare. Where you're living now. Where you're living now. <laughs> no, no, enough, enough. Let's, out you come, out you come. Where, where is Galway? Okay, good, good. Here we are. So, so we're, um, this is Galway, this is Milton, I mean, we've got, so, who have we got? Let's try and get our bearings here, so, so where are you? Oh, there, up there. We've got Kildare over here, and uh, where have we got over here? I'm Donegal. I'm Donegal. Yep, okay, and where are you? This is East. This is East. Wait, oh, no, I lied to you. Sorry, North is up here. Yes, West is over here. East is over here. Thank you. Oh, I'll tell you until I'm not a joke. Yes. Yes, we've got we uh, Westport or something. Yes, that's good. Uh, who's the furthest to the south then? Where are we? In the Good. Okay, so who else have we got in the house who isn't on this map? I'm a female. <laughs> <laughs> Good. God bless you. Um, no, that's, that's fine. Um, right, so that's it. Um, that was purely just to get us talking and a little bit of community development, which is this idea. Actually, a really important facet of community development is fun. Um, fun and food, actually. Okay, let's sit down. The food I don't know. Thank you. It's for rural community development. Uh, we've talked about the building on people's self-interest, uh, acknowledging where people are coming from, using that as a positive force. And equally, facilitators, community development workers, the intermediaries, making that bridge, Lorraine, Dave, um, across from the community to the outside and, and in reverse. To give you a definition um, from David Clark from way back in 1985, David Clark in 1985, community development workers are, quote, available to support and stimulate local effort. So available to support and stimulate local effort. They are concerned with a broad spectrum of social and economic and often environmental matters with problem solving and interagency collaboration. So community development workers are available to support and stimulate local effort. They're concerned with a broad spectrum of social and economic and often environmental matters with problem solving and interagency collaboration. So from 1985, very early um, mention of the pursuit of sustainability, those three capitals, social, economic, environmental, 
and the linking idea of capital, the bridging across that community development workers represent. So what were the, the skills that, that were generated by um, the different participants in, in this research? What, what skills did they perceive as necessary? Bingo! We have the communication. That need for um, communication, connecting within and without the community, and also that idea of selling, of marketing, of winning hearts and minds. So bringing people alongside. Secondly, as a part, I guess, of, of reliance, we have this idea of project management. Generating the ideas, managing the ideas, gaining acceptance for those, reviewing what's happening, and finally bringing the circuit round in order to make adjustments for improvement. Leadership was seen as crucial, and in particular the idea of focus, staying focused, very much like yourselves with your research. You know, there's the danger that you get shifted off into really interesting side alleys. You need to, to retain that focus to be most effective. Flexibility and adap adaptability. Um, the idea of who did, who did early studies in biology? Anybody do early studies in biology? Some of us. What does that look like to you? Thank you. So a single cell creature. I'm not saying that people in villages have only one cell. That would be not a good idea. To so um, the idea of the amoeba in terms of flexibility and um, adaptability. The amoeba, when it meets an obstacle, what does it do? Change its form to avoid it. Yeah, great. So it changes its form to, to move around it. Just so with community development. You meet an obstacle, you withdraw, you push around it, you find different ways. Coordination. Coordination may be very physical. You know, meetings within the community that don't clash. So you don't have your action group meeting on the same night that um, Ireland are playing in the semi-finals of the World Cup or whatever. Uh, but it also is to do with coordinating the, the skills I remember when I, when I worked um, in a small community in, in the north of England, there was an issue about using the existing housing, uh, releasing some of those big houses for younger families to occupy. And there was a very elderly woman, Lizzie Ridley, who was able to coordinate the views of the local elderly people. You know, who was willing to move from their house into um, specially provided shelter housing? So, coordination of people's abilities. And then finally, there's this movement towards an asset-based approach as opposed to a deficit model. The idea, the idea that there is movement from communities being something broken to be fixed and rather than that um, highlighting capabilities and assets. Yeah. There's a question about values sure. and ingredients. You haven't mentioned power as a dynamic construct, but that's also been about 
providing that at the moment it might be good about this play wrong, but it's focusing on a lot of community. What about and the external power factors that communities have to deal with? And that can be a barrier or it can be an advantage. But it's not we haven't actually spoken about that in community development, especially from, from a radical Yeah. Um, yes, this is very much um, from the bottom up view. Um, and it's partly going back to the idea of the independence, the self reliance, the, the movement away from, from central control. Um, but you're absolutely right. Certainly within um, most European policy and UK policy, there is the rhetoric of community based action, which I wouldn't say is empty, but I would say um, that that rhetoric is overblown at present. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I think you know, what I've tended to concentrate, is, concentrate on is looking specifically at the community up, is looking at the, the gatekeepers, those within the community or connected with it. Anybody else want to come in on that point about power and power relationships? Okay. Um, what about the qualities that are required in relation to radical rural community development? Um, interesting set of, of words which were generated from participants. Um, I mean, I'm going to leave those up just for a, for a few minutes. I want, I want you to think in maybe groups of three or so. I want you to think about the, the qualities or the skills that community development activists require. You know, what, what are those ingredients, what are those capabilities that individuals within smaller communities need in order to become adaptive, to do things for their own benefit? So for example, um, one of those qualities might be a sense of humour, an ability to laugh off the trials and tribulations. Okay, so that's what I want you to do just for three or four minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I want you to. I'm talking about activists, please. So, those people who are active within a village or a small community, what sorts of qualities do you think are essential for them to succeed? So, um, let's see what you come up with. So, if we just sort of move around the, the room, we start over here. Can you give us some of those qualities that you think are essential? So, the um, first of the ideas we've, we've got over here is picking up on communication and being able to tailor that communication to lots of different audiences, whether you're talking to the shopkeeper or to your TD or you're discussing with um, some sort of formal agency. So an ability to speak truth to power um, in a way that is intelligible. How about over here? Um, uh, so qualities, um, someone who's identified, able to identify uh, what we might call the wicked issue. Okay. The, the uh, sort of pressing issue that need to be discussed. And then someone who needs, who's able to span boundaries between organizations. Okay, so the, the ability to focus and identify the compelling and complex issues. And what was the second bit? Uh, like a boundary span, someone who was able to span the boundaries between organizations. Yeah, yeah. So somebody who is, is sort of 
moving outside the box, I suppose. Yeah. Great. Right. Great. Right. Um, over here, then. Another idea. Keep keeping the, 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 the goal in mind. Very often when you get into a conversation and then as a community activist, you, yep. up, you go around and I start off talking yep. about one thing and you end up talking about 15 things. Yes. And 15 very different ways of doing those 15 things. Yep. And then you, know, you need somebody who can say, well, you know, we started off trying to yep. do X. Now we're doing Y, Q, R, and P. Yep. You know, we haven't actually yes. done that. We said we were going to look at Lovely. So, so keeping in mind the goal, but also being aware of, um, you know, maybe the goal shifts. Maybe, um, you know, there, there are opportunities or there are issues that you haven't initially considered. So some degree of um, flexibility, listening, ability to adjust. But, but the goal thing, again, I would draw it back to your um, research. Keep in mind your research goals, the aim, the objectives that you have. Stick to those like glue. Those are the things that generate your method, the way that you approach things. Um, keep that focus. Okay, any, any others? Patience. Patience, absolutely <laughs> crucial. Yeah. An ability to an ability to hold your cool, hold on, yeah. um, be able to listen, uh, be able to take in other points of view, yes. be able to, yep. but as I said, the previous one, sticking to your goal at the same time. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think yeah, that flexibility is important. That you don't get totally fixated on something, but you have to yeah. listen to others and then adapt to it. Great. So listening is absolutely critical. Any any others? I think that's very important. Clear and loud voice. A clear and loud voice. Yes. Do you mean literally and metaphorically? Do, yes. do you mean a, yes, a you collective? Mean, yes, yes. Some people are very easy to listen. Like some people are just stuff nobody listens to this girl mouth. Yes. Really? Yes, yes. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, some people have a pleasant voice, you know. If you, if you listen to radio, for instance, some people are very. You, you like to listen to those people, yes. some people. Yes. I think it's important. It is. Yeah. Okay, so, so that ability to, to clearly communicate. Yeah. Anything else? This is kind of comes back to the vision idea about the ability to mobilize and align mm -hmm. people at a micro level, their self interest with the. Great. Yeah, so it's linking across again, mobilising, and not just the mobilising, but also the, the maintaining the momentum, or recognising that something is, is time limited. You, know, you may often have something which is very modest and small and short, and that's great. You don't have to keep going just for the sake of it. Okay, I'm moving towards a close, and you will be pleased to know, I'm sure. Um, the, the training needs that came out from, from our research are captured here. In particular, the importance of networking opportunities. In a rural context, these may be using the new technologies. It may be online forums. It may well be um, using what I call, I mean, really strategic opportunism, which is a very grandiose word for uh, a couple of words, but putting yourself into the way of, of other like minded people and those who can assist you. So the strategic opportunism is finding meetings. Um, online discussions, ways of reaching others who can help you and can be useful. The training was very much um, picking up on the issue you identified earlier on, this one of access, and the difficulty that 
activists have and community development workers in terms of being able to reach training. So, for example, when I, when I worked in um, the southwest of England, the travelling time between the north of my patch and the south was probably about two and a half hours. So huge difficulties of people being able to get into central training. Therefore, online teleconferencing, might be even using uh, video conferencing, Skype and so on. Thirdly, the importance of bringing it down to some local meaning. Local people understanding the relevance of the training for them, to them, to their community. So not just something generic, not just something that, that may be interesting, but is not purposeful to local activity. Training in... <coughs> Engagement techniques, ways of reaching and including as many people as possible. And I've put down there planning for real. Anybody come across planning for real as a, a technique, just one out of many? Yeah, you, could you say what you think it is? Um, I haven't been involved in the process of that for about it, but it's kind of like you create or Yeah, so it's, it's a representation of a physical space, exactly as, as said. Usually it's generated by the community for the community. Typically it's the, the local school children who generate a model of a village which people then stick flags into. Different colours indicating we like it, we hate it, it's an eyesore. Classic bit of community development. The children make something, therefore, who's interested? Yes. Yeah. You capture the parents. I want to see the wonderful work of little Johnny and Jemima um, and Mom, if you Mom are in GP. So, um, leadership development, this idea of self help, of self reliance. Local activists tutoring other local activists. People who have done it before, they've done the plan for real, they've produced that community-run bus, they've undertaken a community audit. Peers talking to peers, not outsiders talking to community members necessarily. Um, classically, the, the idea of Elder residents, newly retired people within the community, helping younger people to set up businesses, to start up community <coughs> organisations, and so on. Sharing good practice and sharing bad practice. What didn't work? You know, some of our most crucial learning in life is about what have we learned from our mistake. <coughs> I think one of the things that I continually learn is to um, endeavour to, to try and keep my mouth shut. Um, my wife certainly says, why, why did you say that to So I have a, an unerring anti-Midas touch. Um, and finally, this idea from the research that there should be combined training. Really simple idea, bringing together the county planning managers with local activists, with people from voluntary organisations, so they are training, learning, sharing together. A very simple but powerful idea. People then get to know each other as humans. It becomes... Um, much easier for them to, to contact each other, to put a face to a name, and so on. Some references just at the end there. Uh, most of this is coming out of this um, 
It will be published, it will be online. It isn't yet because um, it's, it's with our sponsors, so you're getting a, a sneak preview. Final couple of things. I have given to you a skills matrix, which is this very nice coloured sheet. This was from previous research um, that I was involved with. And very briefly, very, very briefly, if you look along the top, you can see blue, green, sort of mauvish, and brown. Um, and these are a listing of skills that community development workers, related staff like health workers, social workers, uh, planners, people dealing with community groups, then community development managers, people in management positions, and then local activists. It's the skills and the knowledge that were perceived to be crucial by um, each of those four groups. And if you look down the, the left-hand strip of, of those pages, you can see that they fall into a series of um, broad categories under people management, communication, which we've made a lot of play on, open page project management, <laughs> understanding the bigger picture, again, something we've looked at quite a lot today, linking from the local to uh, the various power um, hierarchies to different policies. Financial management, and then on the final page, page four, you've got a listing of personal qualities. Finally, finally, um, I'm going to give to you, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through this as, as an exercise, but all that I've discussed today, I suspect there may not be enough of these to go around. Um, if, you, if you have to take one between two, um, all that I've been talking about today can be encapsulated in, in the idea of the pursuit of sustainable, vibrant, rural communities. And if you do or you don't get the petal diagram which is coming around, the reference for you, if you Google, you just Google a charter for rural communities, a charter for rural communities, and that will kick up um, online access to what some of you, hopefully most of you, have in front of you. Um, what I've done is I've the petal diagram is is putting forward the case that to be a vibrant and sustainable village or rural community, all these features are necessary. But I have blanked out some of those characteristics. Um, you can pick them up online. I was going to get you to, to do that as a task. We shall forget about that now. Um, but basically, you can see, for example, the idea of enriching social capital and well-being, which is at uh, 6 o'clock, the bottom petal. Um, that is one of those facets, the idea of, of capitalising on the assets on what the community itself has. Final thing I want to say, coming up to, to time, um, which, is, which is relevant to rural community development, but it's also particularly relevant to you as researchers and to you as humans, to us as humans. Um, I've always been fascinated with literature and the sort of nuggets that you can, you can pick out from, um, from books, from plays and others. And, and the one that, that I'll leave you with today is, is actually from Isaac Newton. Um, 
obviously a great physicist, but also a great mystic. And I love the following quote, which is very much about um, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of understanding. And he said something along the lines of, um, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been like a child on the shore, in now and then turning over a more beautiful shell, a more interesting creature, while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Thank you. <laughs> exactly on the lines of, of what you're talking about. It's, it's suggesting certain commandments which are uh, good ways of endeavouring to involve local people in um, determining their own destiny. But it's also talking about those plagues. Um, local power groups which use participation to reinforce their own positions, um, to misrepresent the local voice and so on. So, yes, you're absolutely right. It is much more complex. I wouldn't wish to, to minimise that. I was seeking to focus on a particular piece of work and, and really to, to focus on the, the critical um, area of communities seizing the opportunities in, in at least um, rhetorical terms within policy of doing more for themselves. Because as you say, if they don't do it, nobody else will. 